I'd now, now like to invite Dr. Murli Shastri. He is Chief Executive Officer of IIT Bombay Monash Research Academy. He is somebody who has plenty of experience as a chief scientist with Tata Chemicals, especially in the field of nanomaterials. He's also our regular course faculty for end to end innovation. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, Gayatri, for uh, once again the introduction. So I have been here on a number of occasions and uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again. Uh, no, no assignments in my talk. It's going to be pretty much, uh, well, I hope it's not going to be one way. I hope it's going to be a dialogue. But I'm going to talk a little bit about end-to-end -end innovation, the, basically the topic of this particular um, education program. Okay, so maybe I'll introduce myself. My name is Murli Shastri. And right now I'm the CEO of the IIT Bombay Monash Research Academy. Um, but basically I'm a material scientist by training. I spent about 15 years in academics and then uh, 12 years in industry. So I have moved out of industry into something which is in between industry and academia about three and a half years ago. So that's my background. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the whole journey that one has to go through from ideation to actually launching a product, right? And uh, I have some experience in doing that. Tata Swatch, have, have, has any one of you seen Tata Swatch? The low cost nanotechnology enabled water purifier. I'm a little shocked that you haven't. But uh, anyway, I will introduce uh, the product to you. But more than the product itself, I'll talk about the journey that uh, went into making the particular product. Um, so I have been at the business end of things after going through the grind of becoming a scientist. Um, and I will share with you some of my experiences. But let's make this a two-way thing. Whenever you have a question, please stop and ask me and uh, we'll have a discussion, right? So before I get into this whole business of end-to-end -end innovation, I think we need to spend some time on defining what innovation is. It's, uh, each person has a different perspective on it. But I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time in probably give you a few examples of what I think people are innovators, and, and, and then get your own perspective on this. So just to wake you up a little bit, uh, can you tell me who this gentleman is? And there are no negative marks for wrong answers. Just take a guess. Who is this uh, very distinguished looking gentleman here? Any guess? Take, take, come on. Let's be adventurous here. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you who he is, then you tell me what he is known for, right? Uh, this is Alexander Fleming. What's he famous for? Again, no negative marks. Please, just, just go for it. Say anything that you want. Hmm? Alexander Fleming. Steam engine? No. Penicillin. So he's very well known for penicillin and it's a very beautiful story as to how he actually discovered penicillin. He didn't invent it, he discovered it. Do you know the story of how he discovered it? He was suffering from cold. That's okay, he certainly was suffering from cold. But uh, he's a medical doctor by training. And um, uh, he used to treat patients, uh, injured soldiers in the war. And uh, that's, we're talking about the 20s, 1920s. Uh, and people, the soldiers used to die, not from the injury per se, but from the infections that would happen after the injury, right? And the infections tend to be bacterial infections. So his, uh, he was trying to identify an antibiotic that can treat the bacterial infections and therefore uh, basically help the suffering um, uh, soldiers. So how he discovered it is a very interesting story. He didn't find it uh, by design. So he was growing some petri dishes of uh, certain bacteria and he went on a holiday. Perfect. So it is a serendipitous discovery. So when he came back after a month or so, he looked at the petri dishes and he found that in certain petri dishes the bacteria were dying. But in the vicinity of the bacterial colony, he found that there was certain fungus which was growing. Right? He was smart enough to understand that the fungus was releasing something which was killing the bacteria. And the fungus was penicillium and therefore the name of the molecule that it was producing is called penicillin. Serendipitous. Now the question that I would ask you is, Alexander Fleming was looking for something. And when he saw that Peter is showing that very unusual feature, he could make the connection. Had this been a fresh PhD student, 
looking at the petri dish, your supervisor has told you to go grow some bacterial colonies, and then you find that the bacterial colonies aren't growing, what would a, a, a naive young student do? Throw the, throw the petri dish away. Because it's not the discovery, it's not what the boss wanted you to do. But because your mind is already prepared, you make the connection and you make the discovery, right? So serendipity plays a very significant role in that breakthrough idea. The Eureka moment, as we call it, this happened. So this was a great, beautiful story of that. Who's this gentleman here? If you don't get this, I'll be terribly disappointed. I, I, we're okay with not getting this person, but this person we have to get. He's an Indian, I'm giving you a clue. Who's he? Okay, Chandrasekhar. Yes, Chandrasekhar, and he was known for what? No, very close. He's uh, uh, Raman's, uh, C.V. Raman's nephew. It runs in the family. I think the Nobel gene runs in the family. So he's a nephew of uh, Sir C.V. Raman. He also won the Nobel Prize for the Chandrasekhar limit. He's an astrophysicist, right? So extremely well-known person. This person, of course, you know. Who's this? Einstein. What was Einstein known for? Yeah, theory of relativity e is equal to mc squared. He was also known for the photoelectric effect for which he won the Nobel Prize and nobody remembers him for that, right? So, he's also a very well-known scientist. Who's this? Steve Jobs. When he was much younger, obviously he looked very different, right? We all looked different when we were young. So, this is Steve Jobs uh, and the person who created Apple company, right? The market capitalization of this company is more than the GDP of many, many countries. That's how big they are. Uh, who are these people here? The Wright brothers. And what were they famous for? First flight, right? Of some 14 seconds, all of 14 seconds. What is phenomenal about this particular invention is that they did the first flight. Within about 20 years, transatlantic flight had happened. It is one of those innovations that very quickly became commercial and became something that actually created this whole global village that we talk about. And this person here? <laughs> this is a trick question, actually. <laughs> this is, excuse me, it's not Tesla. It's uh, Thomas Alva Edison. It is Edison. But it's a trick, it's, it's a trick uh, photograph. He's next to a, the gramophone, which was for which Alexander Graham Bell is known. He's known for the light bulb, right? So this is a trick question. Now my question to you is, in this view graph, you've seen all of these wonderful scientists and uh, innovators and technologists. Who are the innovators? Okay, let's take Alexander Fleming. Is he an innovator, in your opinion? He's gone, so he's not going to worry about whether you called him an innovator or not. But tell me, is he, in your books, an innovator? Yes or no? Hands up for those who say he, was, he is an innovator. He discovered penicillin, right, finally? So is he not an innovator? So I'm trying to canvas for him here. Right? Was he an innovator? Yes. He says yes. You say yes. The ladies weighing in one way or the other? No? Yes. Okay, so he was an innovator. We all agree. Fine. How about this gentleman here? The Chandrasekhar limit. Very creative, brilliant, but is it an innovation? I, don't, I have to, I think we should give them all a strong cup of coffee, right? Some caffeine doses is required. Okay, but uh, is he an innovator or not? No. Good. He says no. Einstein? Yes. Why? Why? Atom bomb, not, not a bad answer. Also, nuclear energy, nuclear. right? That's a, that's a good idea. Okay, so the point is just making a discovery like the Chandrasekhar limit without an end application or commercial value or whatever value is not considered to be an innovation. It's a, I mean, you might file a patent, publish a few papers, but that in itself does not constitute innovation. Innovation is also, you know, going up the value chain and showing that there's significant value at the end of the discovery. So in, if you look that, if you use that as a definition, he's definitely innovative, right? Though he never invented anything himself. 
He's a design guy, he's not a technology fellow at all. But he could see a vision, he could think about products that people did not even know that they wanted. He famously said, I don't believe in marketing. He said, I will come up with a product that the customer does not know that she or he actually wants. He created new niche markets. So he was a, he was a thinker, very good in design, but he was, he was absolutely zero in technology. Well, quite, quite low in technology is understanding. This guy certainly wasn't uh, an innovator. These two people, yes. But the three on top, even this gentleman here, if you look at the class, he discovered penicillin, but the actual commercialization of penicillin happened much later. Other people got involved. So in that sense, he was very creative, but not necessarily an, an innovator. So what is innovation? Now let's get to the crux of the whole thing. A number of uh, definitions for innovation, right? I'm not going to go through this list, but innovation is the process that translates ideas into commercial value. This is restrictive. I don't necessarily agree with this. Uh, the value need not always be commercial. It could be social, right? It, there could be other kinds of uh, uh, benefits to mankind, and we'll talk about that in a little while. This is also nice. Innovation is the conversion of knowledge and ideas into a benefit, either commercial or for public good. The benefit may be new or improved products, processes, or services. So this is a slightly more sweeping uh, definition of what innovation can be. So, I mean, we're all from an engineering background, science background. We like equations, right? What a picture is to normal people, equations are to us, right? It, it basically explains, in a, in a very simple way, uh, a very complex uh, concept. So innovation is invention plus exploitation. The inventive step in itself does not constitute innovation. So let's say that you file a patent. That doesn't mean that you're innovative. You're creative for sure, you're inventive for sure, but the value creation has not happened. And this is what we call, at least in the business world, the last mile. The most difficult part is taking something from proof of concept to the market. And value creation is probably a better term to use than exploitation. Exploitation can have a negative connotation. I like the 3M definition, uh, the stepwise process that leads to innovation. So they have a, a nice a template that they use. And all of us agree that 3, 3M is a very innovative company. Do we or do we not? And I'll tell you a little bit more about 3M in a little while, but this is what they say. The practical application and use of creativity is innovation. And there are multiple steps, right? First step is creativity, coming up with a concept to solve a particular problem. The next step is the, of course, the R&D stage where you actually invent a process, proof of concept, technology development, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, taking it to the market, making it commercially viable. These are the three steps. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time on a very interesting story again, the story of Post-it. Can anybody tell me about the story of Post-it? Do you all use Post-it notes? The yellow piece of paper that you stick, write something, peel off, stick again. You all use it, right? What is special about a Post-it note? What's so unique about it? It was never a need. True. It was in need for a few people. And I'll tell you the story of how that happened. But what is, this, what is the special thing about the post-it note? Is it the paper? No. Paper anybody makes, right? I mean, it's been happening for centuries now. But what is special about the post-it note? The adhesive. Right? It's a very weak adhesive. So we can just stick it, peel it off, stick it again. Now, Spencer Silver was the scientist who was working at 3M, and he was looking to invent uh, the strongest adhesive. Really, really super glue, like uh, araldite kind of thing that we have today, right? That was what he was working on. And at the end of that research, he came up with something which was extremely weak. Now, put yourself in his shoes. As a scientist, you've set out to invent the world's strongest glue, and you get the world's weakest glue. <laughs> How do you feel? bad. You think you're a failure, right? But at the back of his mind, Dr. Silver believed that there was some value to this whole thing. He didn't know, he didn't know how to put his finger on, on exactly what the application could be. So they filed a patent. As good companies do, you protect intellectual property by filing a patent. You may not know that whether there's an application coming up, but you just block other people from using it. It's a defensive strategy, filing a patent. So they filed a patent and he could never get to an application for that particular 
very weak uh, glue. So for about six years, he kept talking about it within the internal 3M circles. Nobody did anything about it. They weren't excited. They said, look, you went for the strongest glue, you got this, how do you expect us to be excited? But one fine day in one of his discussions, this gentleman was in the group, Art Fry. He was a business development man. When, he, when Spin, uh, Silver talked to Art Fry about this, the Eureka moment, moment happened. Somebody said they didn't know the need. This gentleman definitely had a need for a weak adhesive. And I'll tell you how the need came about. Art Fry used to sing in the village choir. So, you know, they have a, the church. Every Sunday there's a choir, they sing. He used to sing in the choir and you know, you have a hymn book. So you all, they have books, they open the pages and they sing. Now they bookmark the page. How do you know which page to turn to and which hymn to sing? He used to bookmark it with a piece of paper and every time you flip the page, the bookmark would fall off. He said, wow, here I have this glue. I can bookmark the page, peel it off, put it wherever I want. He made the connection. And then the rest is history. Uh, there's a lot more that happened afterwards. They did a pilot which failed. They again went and did another, another study and then it became a success. But this is how innovations happen. You might think about it as being fate. Sometimes it's, you know, there's a fatalistic component to it. It became a commercial success six years after the invention happened. I think it's a beautiful story. Yeah, so this is what the innovation pipeline looks like. You're all coming up with proof of concepts around nutrition, a value add to waste, uh, crops, etc. And uh, as the uh, professor had said some time ago, uh, one in 10 actually becomes a success. 10 launches in a, in a market, out of 10 launches, one becomes a success. But let me go back a little further to the ideation stage, not just the launch of 10 products, but the ideation stage. So in a typical R&D kind of an environment, you have multiple ideas. The ideas go through a funnel, and at the end of it, only one or two become successful. So let's say you have 100 ideas, maybe one becomes a success, right? And ideas drop out along the way for many, many different reasons, right? Um, it may not make commercial sense. There might be uh, technical issues. There might be regulatory issues, whatever. A number of reasons can knock out the idea, and then you just get one success. So this is what the success rate is like. From ideation to success, this is from BASF. I guess most companies would pretty much subscribe to this ratio. Out of 175 ideas, one becomes a success. So the success rate is very low. It's very risky. Innovation is very risky. So when I was in the corporate world, this is something that we knew from the R&D perspective, but this is not a slide that you want to show to your finance person. The person who's funding your research, the finance guy doesn't like this kind of a slide. Uh, you know, you, you look at 195 ideas or whatever and one becomes a success. The question is, why should I fund your research? Correct? The, so I'm turning the question back to you. Why should anybody fund research if the success rate is so low? Why? Money is hard to come by. Especially in the corporate world, uh, you have to make profits. And uh, if you don't make profits, you're gone. So whenever you invest your profits in future earnings, projects that lead to future earnings, you have to be very, very diligent in how the money gets spent. So why would I give you any money if you tell me that the success rate is one in 175? Companies do it all the time, right? Obviously, they have a secret. And what is that secret? OK, you'll do that. For full disclosure, 1 in 175 is successful, right? I'm going to be very honest about it, but I'll still get the CFO to fund my research. So, you know, you know in, in, in nature, whenever you have high risks, there's always a trade-off. The other side of the coin is that you have high rewards. So out of the one, 175 ideas, one becomes a success. That one success will get you the returns that will cover all the remaining 174 ideas. Right? That's why people play this game. Now, it doesn't mean that you should stick to 1 is to 175. If you can get it to 1 to 100 or 1 to 50, you're ahead of the game. And that's what companies do all the time. They try to weed out uh, failures very early in the game so that you don't put a lot of resources into it. But this is what happens. The one that becomes successful is so successful that it recovers all the costs 
that you, you have incurred for the remaining 174. So that's how it works. It's like investing, right? When you invest money, where do you invest it? You will diversify your investment. You'll something you'll put it in fixed deposit, you'll put it in the bank, debt, you'll put something in the stock market. Stock market will give you high returns, but the risks are also very high, right? You know that exactly what exactly the same thing that you do here. So now I'm going to ask you some questions, right? And this is something that I've been doing for quite some time now. It's a question I pose different audiences, and I give this talk pretty much to a very large spectrum of people right from school students to college students, to teachers, to C CXOs. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll share with you the results. But can I ask you, do we have a tradition of innovation in India? Okay, those of you who believe that we are innovative as a nation, put up your hands. So those of you who believe that we are not innovative as a nation, put up your hands. If for both questions, hands don't go up, then I'm getting a little confused. This is a, you're putting me in a tight spot here. I personally feel, I, I personally feel it is, it is an, an innovation. Uh, often jugar tends to happen when you have certain constraints and you're making do with the technology and if it serves a certain purpose, yes. Now I think the problem comes when jugar most of the jugard that tends to happen tends to be very localized. It doesn't have an impact which goes beyond that particular application. So since we don't see that large impact that you might see with an Apple iPhone or something, people tend to brush it aside as not being innovation. I would consider it to be innovation for sure, right? But that's what, that's what India needs to look at. The jugard that tends to be localized, we need to figure out a mechanism to, to increase the impact. Learn from these jugards that are happening across the country and there are many mechanisms that are being set up to do at the National Innovation Foundation, etc. The whole idea is to connect these Jugard-like uh, innovations that are happening to the larger ecosystem and ensure that the you know, diffusion tends to happen. I think that's where the next, hopefully the next wave happens in the country. So hands do not go up for either. Let me repose the question. How many of you feel that we as a nation are innovative? Good, good. Three, uh, the rest of you feel we're not innovative as a nation, right? Okay. Okay, then, then, then we don't even get to the next question. Can we, dis can we incubate disruptive companies? Does not even become a meaningful question. You will not be surprised, or maybe you're surprised, that this is the ratio I get. Wherever I go across the country, whichever part of the country I talk to, whichever group of people I talk to, the number of people putting up their hands is only about 10 to 15 percent. Why? Why is it that we are so lacking in recognition, first of all? I think it's recognition. I'll give you an example, a number of examples. And after seeing those examples, you're going to say, wow, I knew about this. But I didn't consider that to be an innovation. So if I ask this question at the end of my talk, all of you are going to put up your hands, hopefully. So we don't, we don't give credit for many things that we have done. I'll give you some pictures here. Right? This is just something that came top of mind. I'm sure all of you will have your own collection of interesting innovations that we've done. This is JC Bose. He, uh, he made, he came up with this device for measuring the rate of growth of plants, the Cresco graph. This is a lateral shear interferometer which is used for measuring the refractive index of materials which I've used in a lab course, little knowing that it was invented by an Indian. The Tata Nano, is it a great success story or not? Innovation. And I had the privilege of having a ringside view of what was going on. I used to work with the Tatas at that time. It's a phenomenal story in itself. Then of course, the, you have the Qutub Minar, the iron pillar in Qutub Minar, which hasn't rusted today, till date. It hasn't rusted. So clearly our metallurgical, metallurgy science was extremely good, evolved. Uh, is that innovation or not? Jantar Mantar, innovation or not? Why are we not then not giving credit to ourselves as a nation. We are innovative. And more examples, button. The buttons were invented in the, in the Indus Valley civilization. Urban planning. Urban planning is something, is certainly an innovation. How do you organize a, a big ecosystem uh, in the most um, meaningful way, right? Create, uh, and this is, urban planning is something that we even deal with today. Big cities are coming up. How do you plan a big city? so that you maximize resources. This was done way back, plastic surgery, iron implements, Vedic, we saw that. 
Shatranj, I love this example. We invented chess. Until not long ago, we had uh, the world's number one being an Indian. There's a great, great example of innovation. Rust-free iron pillar, we talked about this. Okay, I think I skipped. Yeah, prefabricated homes and structures. L I talked about this lateral shear interferometer for refractive index. Microorganisms, microorganisms for the degradation of oil spills. It's used today on a commercial scale. Whenever you have a tanker that goes aground, there's an oil spill. It's treated with uh, uh, a kind of fungus which was discovered by uh, Professor Chakravarti. The Cresco graph, the optical fiber with cladding. There's just a few examples, there are many, many more. So we are innovative, right? Now let me enlarge the definition of innovation. We tend to... Yes, but that's, that's because we're talking only about commercial value, right? Uh, just bear... Correct, yes. The metallurgical process for making rust free iron, it has commercial, that is only an example. That in itself is not an innovation, it's just a display of a, of a technology that you have. The, the technology has an application which is quite unique. But bear with me for a minute. I'm talking about different kinds of innovations that we have, right? So process, product, business model and social. And I'll give you examples of each. Once you look at innovation in a slightly broader perspective, you will, you will come up with many more examples, right? You talked about commercial benefit. It need not always be commercial. It could be a social application benefit. There are many such examples, and I'm going to give you a few. Take the Jain Tata Endowment Fund. Have you heard about this fund? It's a very well-known one. It was set up in 1892 very long time ago by Jamshedji Tata when he became a wealthy man. He set up a fund for sending talented young Indian students overseas. We're talking about 1892, early 1900s. India did not have the universities that we have today, right? There's nothing much. So if young Indians had to get a, a high, high quality education, they had to go overseas and he funded that. Now what was the benefit to him? Nothing. It was a philanthropic fund. But he recognized that funding such people, these young students after getting trained will come back to the country and add to the uh, economy of the country. And many of them have done that. I mean, it's a who's who. If you look at the list of people who have uh, benefited from this fund, it's, it's a spectacular list of people, right from politicians to industrialists. They've come back and contributed to the, to the country. This is a great innovation and this is a social innovation. How do you measure the value of this? It's very difficult to do. If these people come back they set up companies, they, and then that contributes to the GDP. How do you estimate the value? It's very, very tough. But you know for a fact that it's, it's immense, right? The portable ECG system, this is a great example. So General Electric GE in Bangalore came up with this innovation. So take the ECG, how much does it cost to take an ECG in a, in a, in a hospital? 60 rupees? Typically about 100 rupees, right? Would be what, I mean, if you walk into a, a private hospital, they'll charge you about 100, 150 rupees. If you go to a government hospital, it might be slightly less. But even 100 to 60 rupees is expensive for a village person, right? Person working in the city, in the villages, they can't afford it. Does it mean that they don't have cardiovascular diseases? They suffer from exactly the same diseases that we suffer, only that they can't detect because the cost of an ECG is too high. So GE came up with this portable uh, ECG machine and you can get an ECG for rupees 9. Okay, and then the cost of the machine itself is only about 25,000 rupees. A normal ECG machine will cost you about a couple of lakhs of rupees. They are able to make this in 25,000 rupees. Now, this is a product innovation. And this happened because there was a need for this. Now, this, the question that I normally ask the audience, audience is, is this kind of an innovation, would it have happened in Europe or the United States? Unlikely. There's no need for reducing the cost because you all have the insurance system, you don't care how much it costs, the insurance company is going to pay for it, etc., etc. In India, we don't have insurance cover. We pay pretty much out of our pocket. So the need exists in the country and this innovation came out. After they came out with this product, this product was launched across the globe. It was intended for India, but it found a market all, all across the globe. It's one of the big blockbuster products. So this is an example of a product innovation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. To quantify accurately. One can come up with hand, you know, ballpark numbers. Yes. So, is there a between the age of the age Not necessarily, right? Um, I don't think you can actually make that statement. There is a need for. Yeah. It's a little easier. It becomes easier to quantify if there's a very clearly defined need, right? But let's take the example of the endowment fund. There was, a, there was a need to send young talented Indians overseas, but even then they would not have been able to quantify. It was just a, a gut feeling that these people would come back and contribute to the country's growth in whatever fields that they come to, right? There was a need. They were expected to come back, they knew that they were expected. Yeah, I think that was one of the terms. In fact, if you even if you look at the fund even today, uh, if you anyone can apply for the fund, right? To go overseas for education. One of the criteria is, is that it's not, uh, it's not something that you can actually hold the person down to, but there's a clause in the application form which says that you should come back and contribute. But yeah, so that's, that's uh, an indirect answer to your question. Um, certain cases it's easy to quantify because you know, look, look at a, let's say you want to launch an ECG machine which is low cost. You can actually roughly estimate the size of the market and say, okay, out, out of the size of the market, I'll get 10% of the market share, you can do the quantification. So within about an order of magnitude, you will be correct. So, the previous case. Okay, so if you look at um, the, the, the components that went into making this ECG machine, right, already existed. They didn't actually invent anything new, they just put it together. Uh, and came up with a package with, which was very low cost. For example, the printing, the printing uh, system for the ECGs was local. Um, so the innovation was uh, completely connecting many things. So there are some examples where the innovation happened from scratch. For example, the iPhone. iPhone is an example where it's completely designed from scratch. The chips were made from scratch. The display was made from scratch. So this is an example where you just package things together. It can. So if you look at the quality of the waveform, the ECG waveform that you get, it's as good as the conventional ones. You can, in fact, it's, it's finding, uh, well, in a big hospital, perhaps they're not replaced, but most of these medic medicos who come home and do this, they use this portable ones now. It can't replace. There's no sacrifice in, in, the, in the quality of the ECG waveform that you get. TCS is a great example of a business model innovation. I, I wanted to give you examples of things, each category, business model, uh, social innovation, product innovation, and service innovation. So this is an example of a business model innovation. Happened way back in 1968, and this is the base, this is the, the foundation of the whole services sector, the IT sector that India has grown in the last 20 years. Okay? It's a phenomenal success. So if you look at the Indian, India's GDP, I think about 40% come from the services sector, of which a very large percentage come from the IT sector. And this is the beginning of the whole story. So they bought a mainframe compu a computer, which is a Burroughs, uh, yeah, the Burroughs mainframe computer, which I use something very similar. So there's an IBM 360. I, you guys will not understand what I'm talking about, so I'll <laughs> give it a miss. But these are very large computers. So 1968, a computer, uh, the kind of computing power that you have on your phone now used to occupy this whole room, IBM 360s and so on. So TCS invested in this, but to leverage that particular investment, they did something called offshore execution of products, projects. So doing projects in India, they you basically they were leveraging the cost arbitrage. You understand what the cost arbitrage is? If you do a similar project in India and in the United States, it'll cost the cost will be different, right? Costs tend to be much lower in India. That's the cost arbitrage. So they use this to develop a, a consultancy services based on computation IT by doing it in India and uh, charging people overseas at slightly reduced rates so you can ca capture the market, right? So this is a, an example of a business model innovation. E Chaupal, you know about this? You know about this example, so I'll skip this. This is also an example of a business model innovation because they did, comp they did nothing new in the sense that the IT, I'm sorry, the uh, internet connectivity existed, computers were there, they just connected the whole thing together and gave you a service and that's why uh, this became such a success. The nano, product innovation. Huge number of innovations have gone into the nano. 
to bring the price point to about 100,000 rupees, 1 lakh, right? Lot of things changed. For example, the whole fuel injection system from Bosch happened specifically for the Nano. They've then taken it back and they have rolled it out for other companies. So a lot of success is there. The Rane group worked on the steering shafts. Uh, incredible things have happened in this case. Now, in the Indian context, right, what is unique about our country? What is unique about India? Population, excellent. We have a very large population, 1.2 billion and counting, correct? Uh, what else do we have? We have 1.2 billion problems, correct? More. Multiply each person by 10 problems, that's our problem. We have enough problems, right? What else do we have? I'm trying to create a macro picture. Yes, we have excellent human resources, what we call the demographic dividend. Yes, a lot of common problems. Excellent. That's what I was hoping somebody would say. Thank you very much. Uh, we have constraints, right? One of the biggest constraints that we have is resources. We have human resources, but natural resources, mineral resources that we need, are energy resources, we don't have enough. So what that does is you can complain about it. And we all complain about it. There's no water, there's no electricity. We complain. That's, that's the nature of, again, Indians. But, but if you look at the challenges, the, the huge challenges also, a constraint can, always, can also become an opportunity. And that's what we saw in the case of ECG machine. If you go to villages, they don't have power. So whatever ECG machine that you're going to deploy will have to work uh, with a battery system, maybe solar. It has to have low, it has to consume very low amounts of power because if you have a battery, it has to last a few weeks at least, right? You don't want to keep changing the battery. So constraints that we are faced with bring with it opportunities for innovation. The ECG example was a great example. So we have a very large population and we have, a, again, of that population, it's a pyramid, a very large number of people in the below the poverty line. We've done spectacularly well. I mean, let's be proud of the fact that the number of people below the poverty line has decreased. The middle class is growing. So people are being pulled from below the poverty line into the middle class, lower middle class, and eventually they'll keep bubbling up. But the problem still remains. We have at least about 250, 300 million people who are below the poverty line. How do we make technology available to them is the, is the million dollar question. It's a question, if you answer it, there's a huge business opportunity. For those of you who have an entrepreneurial bent of mind, there's a huge opportunity here. Correct? If you come up with a solution, see the impact. It'll reach 250, 300 million people. The impact is huge. But you have to work with constraints. Uh, now, the question is, take, I'm going to give you some examples. You talked about nutrition, right? You were, you know, the previous discussion. The people at the base of the pyramid, they also need nutrition. Right? They also need clean water. They need cleaner water than us. They need better nutrition than us. But simply because they earn less than us, they can't buy clean water, nor can they eat high quality food. Correct? When a child grows in India, uh, in, the, in the villages, in the slums, forget about villages, even in the cities, we have a group of people, usually migrants who are traveling from city to city, constructing all these wonderful buildings that we all go into, they live in slums. And uh, a child that grows in that environment, if it does not get the right nutrition till the age of about four or five, it is stunted for life. Whatever nutrition you give the child afterwards makes no sense. It will help to some extent, but the damage is done. So the people here are the ones who need the technology the most. Pure water, because if you don't have good nutrition and good water, your immune system is also not developed. A child's immune system does not develop to the extent that it can uh, deal with impure water or not good quality food. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Poor nutrition, pure water at that age say, sets them up for failure. So the challenge is to provide these people affordable technology, which will, you know, affordable products uh, without compromising on any of the quality standards. So that's what we have as a challenge. Now, you have to think of the problem very, very differently. If you use the conventional mindset of solving a problem, it will not work. As, as she rightly pointed out, Madam, your name, please, again? Shifali. Shifali. 
as Shifali said, you have to work within constraints. Define the constraints and then come up with a solution, right? There's no point in saying I will do something and, and use something. Uh, you, won't, you won't even have the resource to do it. So you need to have a clear understanding of the base of pyramid. Exactly what the needs are. Define the constraints. Make really good assumptions. So this is all how a business person would actually approach this problem. You could also use traditional knowledge. One of the things that we didn't mention is, we talked about 1.2 billion Indians, 1.2 billion problems, constraints. What we didn't talk about is the rich heritage of traditional knowledge that we have in the nutrition space. Nowadays, organic India is selling turmeric and you know, moringa seeds and all that. Well, it's that part of our diet. If you go back, if you have a balanced Indian meal, it contains all of that. You don't need to be popping any pills. A lot of traditional knowledge that we have, which unfortunately we have kind of, we are all McDonald's and all that kind of stuff has come in, right? So we're going away from that. Anyway, traditional knowledge can be a good starting point. I'll give you a few examples, frugal innovation, some templates that one can use. But the best thing to do is to talk about an example. Now in rural India, they do need refrigerators. You have to keep the fruits and vegetables uh, without spoiling. They need it, right? Define a refrigerator for me. What does a refrigerator do? Preserves food items. Correct? So if I keep vegetables outside and it spoils in say two days, if I keep it in a refrigerator, it should spoil in five days or six days. I increase the shelf life. Right? That's the job of a refrigerator primarily. Forget about the fact that it gives you ice and you know it can cool your glass of beer or whatever. That's all fringe benefits. But that's not required. If you define a refrigerator as a contraption that increases the shelf life of perishables, fruits, vegetables, milk, then that's a refrigerator, right? Now, this gentleman, Mansukhbhai Prajapati, came up with this particular product called Mitti Cool. Was this also covered, Gayatri? They make uh, matkas, earthenware, tawas. He makes everything out of clay. And he knows everything that you need. He's a class 10 pass person. So he really doesn't have a, an education in the classical sense. He doesn't have scientific knowledge. But anything that you need to know about clay, he knows. He came up with this device. He made a refrigerator made of clay. And on top of that, there's a uh, reservoir for water. Now, how does, a, how does a clay pot, your matka work? You put water inside, what happens? It holes in the uh, like body of the matka. Yeah. Uh, the water evaporates and there is heat exchange that happens between the air and uh, water. Correct. So, uh, air takes the temperature, the heat and water gets Correct. So, the water evaporates. There's a latent heat of evaporation. And therefore, there's a cooling that happens. So the water in the matka becomes cooler. If you actually measure very carefully and if it, under good conditions, the temperature of the water in the matka can be at least about five to six degrees lower than the temperature outside. Now if you use that concept, so he, he made this uh, refrigerator, you put water on top, the water percolates, it's porous, no? The water goes all over the system, evaporates and it cools. So he created, uh, put some shelves inside and the temperature inside the refrigerator is about five to six degrees lower than outside. You're already making a refrigerator. You can put your fruits and vegetables inside and it will be fresh for a longer period of time. That's all it is. How do you define what the refrigerator should do? Once you define it and you put the constraints in place, you can come up with this kind of a product. Isn't that a great example? Excuse me? No, you don't need electricity, nothing. So we worked with him on putting nano silver to make it a little bit more antimicrobial, but uh, that's a great example. How about the Jaipur foot? I won't go into more detail here, but please go to YouTube and look at examples. People who are fitted with a Jaipur foot, in a very short period of time, they, there's a person who climbs a coconut tree and pulls on the coconuts. It's, so this is a great example. And look at the cost savings. $3 for a Jaipur foot, which otherwise would cost you about $2,500. Phenomenal, and it happened in India. Now I'll tell you about my own personal experience. Having spoken about many other examples, let me talk to you about Tata Swatch. Because this happened in my lab. So I'm very proud of this. When is World Water Day? Is water important for us? Safe water? When is World Water Day? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're doing precisely what many students would do. You can Google it. Correct? This, this question I've been asking for the last, uh, how much, Tata Swatch was launched in 2008, 2009. 
And I used to ask this question. In those days, the internet was not so prevalent. So students would look around. After some time, they had all of you, they could Google. So somebody, that, if there's 150 people, somebody in the back would say March 22nd. And I'd say, wow. Then I realized that he's Googling the answer and then giving me the answer. But it's March 22nd. If I asked you, when is uh, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, you'll be able to tell me, right? Quite easily. Why is it that we don't remember Water Day, World Water Day? It's so important. H2O, that molecule, is the stuff of life. So that's World Water Day. Well, I'll give you a secret. Are you married? Yes. Please celebrate Valentine's Day every day. <laughs> it's more important than the water, I would think. Anyway, so the drinking problem, water problem in India, look at the numbers, right? 75% of the rural population in India does not have access to safe drinking water. 80% of diseases and 33% of all deaths are caused by unsafe drinking water. I know this firsthand. I mean, it is not such a drastic thing, but... This, I, I know of an example recently, um, an estimated 400,000 children in India under the age of five years die every year from diarrhea, drinking contaminated water, entirely preventable. And schools in India don't have safe drinking water. And to make things worse, we don't have a standard water treatment system or a methodology in place in our country. And we call ourselves a developing nation, soon to be a developed nation. We have many challenges. So my story begins here. So Mr. Ratan Tata, who was the chairman of the Tata group at that time, after the launch of the Nano, was asked by somebody in the audience. There was an uh, uh, interview that happened. And somebody asked him, what would you expect as being the next big innovation happening from the house of Tatas? He said, I'd like to have one of the Tata companies come up with a solution for providing safe, affordable drinking water. And uh, we picked it up. So when he gave this challenge, I was at Tata Chemicals at the time, and we had set up a research group, an innovation center. We picked up this particular problem, and we said we'll solve this. Now, when you say safe drinking water, accessible to millions of India, what is safe? What is affordable? How do you define those things, right? So when we got into this business, we didn't know what was, we knew, of course, what was safe. But what would be affordable was not something that we knew. Okay, am I jumping? Let's see. Okay. So the whole drinking water problem, I, I talked to you about the numbers. I gave you some statistics. There's one slide that I forgot to add, which the moment you come up with a problem, what do you do? The first thing that you do is you look at uh, technologies that are available in the market, right? I'm talking about 2000 and 2006. So we looked at all technologies that were available. So there's desalination. Uh, there's reverse osmosis, uh, there's UV treatment, etc., etc. So you have a long list of uh, technologies that are available. Then you have chlorine treatment. We looked at the pros and cons of each technology and we said this will not work. Because if you wanted to make it affordable, it cannot use electricity. You want it to be used in rural India, just like the Mitikul, no electricity, right? So we wanted to come up with a product which would not use electricity. Many technologies came, uh, we had to drop those technologies as not being feasible. So we had to come up with something completely new. And we came up with what looks like this. This is the end result of something like five and a half years of research. I'll get into the details in a little while, but this is what the product looks like. There's no electricity. There's a reservoir. You fill your water here. There's a purifier here, and then you get safe water. And this is what the Tata Swatch does. It purifies 3,000 liters of water. It removes bacteria and viruses. So when I say safe drinking water, it means that the water should not have any pathogens. The disease causing component is basically bacteria, virus, and cysts. So any technology that you come up with must be able to kill bacteria, must be able to kill virus, and must be able to kill cysts. So that's, that's the challenge. So removes bacteria and virus, tested across, etc., etc. This is more of a sales pitch. But this is what it has inside. If you look at Tata Swatch, it uses rice husk cash, RHA. Does anybody know how rice husk cash gets generated in India? Somebody talked about bran, you talked about rice bran, right? Do you know how the whole polishing, how the rice mills work? Tell me how it works. Correct. What happens at each polishing stage? 
Brand. Correct. And you made the right statement. You said exactly the right thing. The rice uh, grain with the bran is very nutritious. You take away the bran, you take away a lot of the nutrition of the rice. You're absolutely right. So thank you. Thank you very much. So if you go to a, a rice mill, the, the rice, the paddy comes with all the husk and all that. The first stage of polishing, it removes the husk. Second stage of polishing, second and third stages of polishing, they remove the bran. And then it, you get the white rice, right, which we all love so much. In the northeastern parts, of course, you have different colors. But predominantly, white rice is what we all consume. And we're all very happy because it looks white and it's polished. But the fact is that the most, most of the nutrition has been removed, right? And the funny thing is, if you want to buy red rice, brown rice as they call it, you pay more than white rice. Why? Why should you pay more for something which has one less <coughs> polishing step? Excellent, good point. But even if you even if you took the storage problem out, please sit down. Excellent point. Even if you took the storage issue out of the picture, there is something called value-based pricing. When you sell a product in the market, uh, the value that the customer gets is how you will price the product. So if I if I tell the customer, look, I'm going to give you rice with protein, which is there in the brand, I charge a premium for the for that product because it's a value-based pricing. But if you look at the entire the process leading up to production of white rice versus brown rice, it is actually cheaper to produce brown rice than white rice. But for the customer, the value is in that, and therefore you price it like that. So there's a whenever we go into whenever we start, let's say that you come up with a product, right? How do you price it? There'll be a cost for making the product, which is the cost. The price is the cost plus the profits. Now, how do you determine the profit? So there's a, there's, a, there's a strategy that businesses use, it's called value-based pricing. So once you understand what the value is to the customer, you price it accordingly, which is why your phones are so expensive. You know how much of a profit I, Apple makes on each phone, iPhone? It's huge. They make something like 80% profit on that, simply because the customer perceives significant value, so value-based pricing. So anyway, that's, we got into a little bit of a tangent. Uh, the rice husk that you get, the first layer is burnt. So the rice mills, they burn it. Why do they burn it? Just because they like to burn? What is the, what is the reason be behind burning of rice husk? It has to be a benefit. Everything that industry or you know, corporates do has a meaning. You can't do it just for the heck of it. Can I, can I move to the sugar industry? Have you seen sugar cane, sugar mills? What do they do? They crush the sugar cane, they extract the juice, and then you make uh, molasses, and you make sugar, and so on and so forth. But you also get something called bagasse. What, does, what is bagasse? It's just the biomass. After extraction of all of this, what do they do with the biomass? They burn it. So sugar mills, they burn the bagasse, and they generate power. It's called cogeneration. And the power is used for internal use, it's also fed into the grid because they generate a, a lot of excess power. They feed it into the grid and they make money. In fact, sugar mills make much more money off power generation than they actually make in selling of sugar. So that's, so a similar thing happens in the case of rice husk. You can burn the rice husk, generate power. That's what sugar mills, I'm sorry, rice mills do. But there's a significant difference between rice husk and bagasse. And the difference is that rice husk contains a lot of silica, SiO2. The, you know, your glass is all SiO2. So it contains a lot of SiO2. When you burn uh, rice husk, the silica remains, right? The carbon component combusts, the nitrogen component combusts, and you're left behind with an ash. If you Google rice husk ash, <coughs> India traditionally has been using rice husk ash for water treatment filtration. They use it also. Some parts of India, they also use it for as a tooth powder. Lots of applications. So. We took this particular rice husk ash. We already knew that it is used as a filtration medium, but we also recognized that it could not kill bacteria. It could filter things. So you take a rice husk ash filter past water, it will remove a lot of suspended impurities, colors and so on and so forth, but it cannot kill bacteria. So we were asked to come up with a solution where it became antimicrobial. 
so you get safe drinking water. So we came up with a technology which is based on nano silver. Gayatri, how am I doing for time? I think I should be able to finish much before that. Anyway, so we, we were told to look at this particular technology and this technology had already been in some sense shown in a sister Tata company. So TCS had been working on this and they came up with a product which is called Sujal. Now Sujal had been used in India during the earthquake in Bhuj, during the tsunami. They had used it uh, for emergency relief conditions, right? So whenever you have an emergency, you're not really too worried about the highest quality of water. You just need to get safe water quickly available to people who are in that zone, right? So they had come up with a rice ash based uh, water purifier, but we came up with a technology for putting nano silver inside. Have you all heard about nanotechnology? So what does nanotechnology do? Any examples of nano uh, products that you are using? Which? Graphene nanoparticles, but give me an application. LEDs, LEDs use nanoparticles, yes. Sensors. Sensors, sensors, many sensors are now nano based sensors. Uh, your automobiles tend to have uh, plastic parts which have got nanoparticles inside. So we had to come up with a solution which was based on a nanotechnology and we used nano silver. Nano silver is a very, very well known antimicrobial agent. It can kill bacteria. Silver. So if you see traditionally in, in many Indian households they would use silver vessels, silver glasses, tumblers for drinking water. It's, it can disinfect water. It actually kills bacteria. So we used nano technology, uh, put the silver inside, came up with a process to put nano silver inside these pores. This is a scanning electron microscopy image. I think maybe there's a better image here. So this is how Rice's cash looks when you put it under an electron microscope. Have you seen a scanning electron microscope? Yeah. So you can actually get down to very, very high magnifications, up to very high magnifications, low length scales. So this is what it looks like. So from a scientist's perspective, uh, this is a great, it's a great material to actually play around with. You have these porous structures and uh, rice's cash is a mixture of silicon dioxide, as I told you, SiO2. And whenever you do a combustion, whenever you burn rice, rice husk, the combustion is never 100%. So, you know, it's about 97, 93%. So if you look at rice's cash, it's about um, 90, 93% to 95% of silica and the remaining is activated carbon, charcoal. And for the chemistry, chemists would know that activated carbon is used for removing organics. So if you take an activated charcoal column and you pass organics, it can separate out the organics uh, from, from the, uh, the medium. So this is a mixture of activated carbon and um, silica, active silica as we call it. Our challenge was to be able to figure out a way of putting nano silver inside. Nano silver is a potent uh, antibacterial agent. It will kill all kinds of bacteria, gram negative, gram, gram positive bacteria very, very facile, but we had to come up with a chemistry where the silver goes inside these pores. But remember, you're drinking this water. So the water flows through this filter made of these kinds of uh, structures. You cannot, you should not be drinking the silver directly. There's a limit. So the US EPA, remember this, this is a food grade product actually. We have to be very careful in what actually comes through. So the silver has to be below a certain level, which is about 20, 20 to 30 ppb. You can drink water which has got silver in it at 20 ppb levels for your whole life and nothing will happen. But the moment you go slightly higher, it creates health issues. So we had to come up with a strategy where we put silver inside, uh, we kill the bacteria, but we don't compromise on the safety of the water that comes through. Remember, it's not just us that are going to be drinking the water. Young kids will be also drinking the water who are much less capable of uh, withstanding those kinds of uh, toxicity issues. So we use nano silver. Um, it's a very potent biocide, but it's completely safe for humans below certain limits. It has the highest antimicrobial activity of all the heavy metals, and this is the way it works. So if you're really uh, interested in knowing how it kills bacteria, this is what it does. It breaks the disulfide linkages in proteins. Uh, it also binds to the sulfhydryl groups and deactivates the, those particular functional groups, and therefore it kills the bacteria. And uh, it's easy to make in some sense. So we, and it's very slowly dissolving in water. Now the question is, how do we make these two things come together? Rice's cash plus nano silver to come up with a 
safe uh, affordable drinking water solution. So we work very closely, this is TCLIC which is my, my lab, Tata Chemicals Innovation Center and we work very, very closely with the TRDDC to come up with a process. You know, it is easy to draw the schematic, silver precursor, add reducing agent, filtration, drying, it is something that any MSc student in the lab can, can do. But remember, this is a process that has to be scaled up, this is only a proof of concept, this has to be an industrial process and it has to work every time. You cannot get it wrong because I, we sell a million products, not even one of the products should be defect, defective. So this product, this process has to work time and time again and it must comply with all the regulatory frameworks that you have. So this took us nearly three years to come up with a recipe to do this. And the collaboration was, uh, we worked very closely with TCS as I already talked about, we also worked very closely with this quoting from us feedback and I didn't mention that we also had a collaboration with, ah, doesn't come here, sorry this view graph should also include Titan, Titan has got a precision engineering group. So we came up with the proof of concept, they came up with the whole engineering process, the automated process to make millions of these uh, filters. So it was a very great example of uh, collaborations across the group. What am I trying to say in all of this, if you look at nano silver it existed, I mean people Good. Chemistry, right? We used ion exchange, we used what we call exchange chemistry. So if you take silica, uh, SiO2, if you put silica in water, if you look at silica, if you take your glass, uh, whatever, that's, that's plastic, but uh, whatever glass surface that you have, if you expose it to water, the surface gets ionized. So at the surface, because you have uh, dangling bonds, uh, you have it's SiO, 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 right? But at the surface, there's a truncation that happens, and therefore you have what is called SiOH. So, you know, hydroxyl groups get act, uh, attached. Now, what we did was we tried we worked out a mechanism where we can replace the hydrogen, the proton, with a metal ion. So you can replace H plus with Ag plus. You take silver nitrate solution, and you put your glass inside at the right pH conditions. You can exchange the proton with the silver ion. So here you have. Let me go back to the picture. Yeah, so this is the silica, it's a powder, right? So we compress it, put the whole thing into silver nitrate solution. We are just the pH just right now. To ionize the uh, silica, you need to go to slightly basic conditions. So the proton can get detached. And then we replace it with, so inside, this is the ship in a bottle. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because people don't really understand how complicated it is to put silver nanoparticles inside these pores. You can't make the silver nanoparticles and then push, stuff them inside, it doesn't work. So we grow the silver nanoparticles inside the pores using ion exchange. We exchange the proton inside these pores and then we reduce the silver ions with citric acid. You can reduce it in situ, right? So the silver Ag plus becomes Ag0 and these Ag0 atoms, they fuse together to form the nanoparticles, but it's all happening inside the pores. So you're growing the silver nanoparticle within the pore rather than making it outside and putting it inside. So it's like a ship in a bottle. Have you seen those bottles when which ships are there? How does it go inside? <laughs> so this is, this is the analogy that I give. So you grow the silver nanoparticles inside and because they're growing inside, they don't come out very easily because the pore diameter tends to be smaller than the pore cavity size. So they're stuck inside. And so when the water flows through, the silver nanoparticles don't come out. They slowly leach out the silver ions. But thank you for the question. I completely missed uh, talking about it because one doesn't know in the audience, for many of many of the of you in the audience, the chemistry might not be exciting, but that's how I, we did it. And it took us, it took us nearly two and three years to work out the chemistry because we had to use food grade uh, salts. You can't use any salt. The government says you can only use food grade ingredients, the capping agent. We put the silver inside, we need to cap the surface. The capping agent also has to be food grade. We made a mistake. We lost about a year because we used the wrong capping agent, it was not food grade and when we went for an approval they said no you can't use this, we had to go back, come up with a completely new surfactant and the moment you replace the surfactant with something else the whole chemistry, the whole process changes, horrible. So anyway, we learned the hard way, so that's how we did it, does it answer your question? Good. So to make silver nanoparticles, the question that she asked, ion exchange chemistry is very very well known. Silica is very, very well known. What did we new, do new? 
we brought two things together and came up with something which is completely different, right? So I believe we are in this mashup era. Everything is getting mashed up. Two and two is certainly not equal to four. It's very synergistic, right? Whenever you have synergies, it's nonlinear, nonlinear phenomenon, the outcomes tend to be unpredictable and tend to be higher than the sum of the parts. And there are great examples of this. I, I'm not talking through my hat. I mean, there are enough examples to show that we are in this mashup era. A number of Nobel Prizes tend to be won by people outside the discipline. Physicists win it in medicine. Medical doctors win it in chemistry. And in fact, a scientist also won it in, uh, in peace, won the peace prize, which is quite a significant shift. But uh, we are seeing all these things happening. And I'm going to give you one great example. Um, has anybody seen this? Nintendo Wii, it's a game, you've seen the Nintendo Wii. This is a person who invented the Nintendo Wii. It's a game, you know, computer game. People like to play computer games. All of you have got kids. They're also getting into the computer games period situation. They sit in front of the gay computer and play. He invented a game which used an accelerometer plus a gaming console to come up with something like this. Now, in a computer game, you're normally sitting, right, and playing. You may be moving some joystick or some cursor. Here, you actually are an athlete. So, what he did was he took an accelerometer. Do you know what an accelerometer is? It's there in all your cars. Your cars, your cars have airbags, right? When you have a collision, the airbags deploy, and they prevent you from getting badly injured, right? Now, how does the airbag get deployed? It uses something called an accelerometer. So the accelerometer is a piezoelectric device which detects changes in, acceler changes in velocity, which basically detects acceleration. So if you're suddenly applying brakes, you're, you're, you're decelerating, you're accelerating, but in the reverse direction, and then the airbag deploys. He took that accelerometer from the automobile industry and put it into your handheld device. You move your hand, it changes, the, the, the current on that piezoelectric device changes. He coupled it with the, uh, with the display, and now you can play with the display. The moment you move your hand, it's like a tennis racket. Let's say you're playing tennis with somebody on the, you know, the game. You can actually move your hand. You can do yoga. You can do all kinds of things, and people are now becoming fit. They're using, they're using these computer games for fitness. It's becoming a trend now, and that's a great example of how uh, an application in one area gets used in something else, right? It's ma mash up everything. So I'm going to wind up now and then take questions because I, this, or this group has been particularly silent. So I'm going to now give a little bit of time to seek questions from you and uh, any, any feedback that you might have. So for culture of innovation, who should be innovating? We tend to think that innovation happens in corporate R&D teams or in academia, in, in, in research labs. But anyone and everyone can innovate. And I gave you the example of Mansukhbhai Prajapati Mitikul. He's not a scientist, he's not working in a corporate R&D lab, but he innovates. Anyone and everyone can innovate, it's not just scientists, but you will fail, right? You're, you're going to fail and you should be willing to fail. If you're coming up with a solution, as Gayatri had asked, if there's a need, you have to be very close to the need, which is the customer, and co-develop a solution rather than offer solutions. Some amount of ignorance is good, so you need to get outside in perspective, uh, so multidisciplinary approach is good. And I like this, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It was a statement made by um, Steve Jobs, and uh, you see the examples. How many of you have iPhones in this group? You all are Android people? You're an iPhone, you're a Mac, uh, Apple guy? What is special about the iPhone compared to any other phone? Just get down to the design level. It has only one button. You don't have home, you don't have, I mean, you just, you have only a home button, right? Whereas all Android other devices will have three buttons. So when Steve Jobs, there was a big internal discussion about whether Apple should have one button or two buttons or three buttons, right? He said, keep it simple. It should be so intuitive for people to use. And so he made this, he said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. He's absolutely right. It's very difficult to actually come up with a very simple product. It's very easy to add bells and whistles to make it complicated. But to come up with something which is very simple, which will do the job, which is intuitive, is tough. So that's his philosophy. 
If you are successful once, do not think that it is going to lead to success again. This is many company, many companies tend to fail. They think that there is this inertia of success that prevents them from uh, further successes. Multifunctional teams are good to have and then you must be quick to change. A huge challenge, right? Uh, the one thing that we can all agree on is that the rate of change is going to increase. The world is going to ch change much more rapidly than it is today. And above all, stay hungry and stay foolish. I just want to leave you with uh, maybe a couple of cartoons and some statements by some very wise people. Again, it goes back to what Shivali said. Um, our world has enough for each person's need, but not for his greed. And we are going to get increasingly into a resource constrained world. Resources are going to get less and less. So how much of innovation can we do? But the good news is that technology has developed to such an extent that we are all living higher level. The standard of life overall across the globe is much better today than what it was 50 years ago. Everybody, if you take the average, it's gone up. Only 10 years ago, the more with less technology reached a point where this could all be done. All of humanity now has the option of becoming enduringly successful. So this is a very optimistic statement to make, which I believe in. We have at our disposal enough tools to be able to solve all the grand challenges. Now, the challenges to being an innovator, it's pretty tough. So here is this gentleman. Uh, he is going for an interview. And the lady across the table who is interviewing him asks him a question. So she says, your resume states that you worked with two presidents, you won the Nobel Prize, and you've also climbed Mount Everest. That's all very good, but how are you at tele how good are you at telemarketing? <laughs> so to be an innovator, we talked about the whole value chain, right? Understanding the need, coming up with a solution which is proof of concept, right? And then taking it to market. So there's a lot of steps that happen. And all of these steps tend to happen in different places. So if you look at IIT Bombay, IIT Bombay is very good at proof of concept. They'll come up with a solution which is proof of concept, but IIT Bombay does not have the wherewithal to scale up or even go to the market. Those are done by companies. So all of this has to come together. But you need, as an innovator, you need to understand each segment of the value chain. You won't be an expert, but at least you need to know what happens at every stage. That's the demand that will be placed on people who are wanting to innovate. You have to be the jack of all trades and maybe a master of one or two. You have to be a domain expert, but you need to be the jack of many, many trades. And finally, multidimensionality is the key. If you want to come up with a solution, and this is a typical corporate example, you do a market survey, and the market survey that says that we need to come up, the solution is an apple, this is hypothetical, right? The market survey says you need to have a low cost, affordable, safe drinking water solution, which is the apple in this case. That's the idea. Then of course you try to come up with a solution. What is the uh, technological solution that you're going to have? You pitch the idea to your team and you were talking about that. I think Professor Anantishwan was saying you get one crore of rupees and you'll come up with a solution. You might need three crores of rupees to come up with a solution, but capital constraints will reduce what you can do. Technical feasibility, you'll come up with a solution and then you'll find that it infringes on somebody else's patent. Somebody else has already done it, so you'll have to go back to the drawing board. Then there's a legal review that happens. To come up with an innovation which is unique is tough. There are many, many smart people out there. We are not the only ones. If you come up with a, you know, a, a, a patent, you can be pretty sure that someone else has already come up with something like that. So you have to worry about infringement of patents or legal review. Then, of course, internally, the management might take a lot of time. And finally, after all of this, you come up with a product which is applesauce. Whereas the solution that's required in the market is an apple. The moral behind this particular cartoon is that upfront, if you knew that there are going to be capital constraints, there's a technical feasibility issue, there's a legal issue, management, etc., you put all of this in, then you come up with a solution which is much more likely to be what the customer wants. Correct? Okay? So multidimensionality also is a key here. I think that's the end of my talk. Yeah, uh, I will close here. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, it was a pleasure interacting with all of you. If you have any more questions, any comments, suggestions, I'm happy to hear you out. Thank you. So the number of patent the number of patent databases that you can use, um, WIPO has 
For example, if you want to look at all US patterns in a particular area, if you get the right keyword, you can get access to all the abstracts. You won't get the entire pattern, but you can see the abstract. Uh, that gives you a good idea as to what the technology is all about. Unfortunately, the Indian patents is just being digitized. So if you want to look at all the Indian patents that have been filed, uh, the databases are not so good. But European, American patents, you can get it through the internet. Anyone can access it easily. But the key is the right keywords that you put in. If you don't put the right keywords, you might miss uh, a lot of patterns. Correct. No, they go to the WIPO site, W-I-P-O. Uh, it'll give you all the patterns that you need. The, the technology that they use is different. They don't use rice as cash. They use, um, well, they have many products, right? Pure, I mean, if you look at Hindustan Leo, they have many classes of products. So they have products which are, which use uh, chlorine, chlorination. They use chlorine for treatment of water. They have UV treatment. Uh, they also have a polycationic membrane which they use. So the technologies tend to be very different. Using rice as cash with silver, only Tata Swatch does it that way. That's how we were able to keep the cost low. I was hoping that somebody would ask the question, how is it that Tata Swatch is so uh, affordable? It's affordable because the raw ingredients that we use, the, the raw material that goes into making Tata Swatch is free. Rice husk ash, you can get it for free. So the rice mills, when they burn the rice husk, they generate the ash, they just dump it. They don't have any use for it. So when we came up, said we, we, we want the rice as cash, they said you can take it for free, you only pay for the transportation cost. For them also it's very nice that we're taking it away because the uh, pollution control board, they come down heavily on them for dumping it. They, they're not supposed to dump it, but they do. So they're very happy that we took it away. But once Tata Swatch became successful, they started asking us for some amount of money and we, for, take, for the rice as cash, which we said, I think fair enough, the value has to be shared, right? Uh, but that's how the costs were low. The main filtration material in Tata Swatch is almost free. That's how the cost will look. It is available, but they have not done a good deal in marketing the product, right? So if you take across the country, it's available in most parts, um, but now it's become a corporate social responsibility initiative. But if you have any problem, I think uh, Gayatri, please share my email with them. I can connect you to people and you can get, get hold of uh, Tata Swatch. Any any more questions? <coughs> yes, yes. So it'll okay. Good question. So can I take a little bit? How much of time do I have? I'll just take a little bit of time to show you the other innovations that went into the product. Every six months, roughly. So about three thousand liters. So it's been calibrated so that you know, you water goes like this, right? I. I think, where's the diagram? Okay, anyway, the water goes through and uh, there's this, uh, what we call it the end of life device. So the water keeps flowing through this and this actually is a sparingly soluble inorganic salt. So when water fo flows through this, very low solubility inorganic salt, which actually has a nutrition value, uh, it slowly dissolves and you have a spring on top. So it's calibrated such that when 3000 liters of water flow, the spring will close shut. So this is designed for typically about six six months of use, and then you replace the cartridge. That's all. So is this uh, affected by hard work? It is. Yes, it is. So um, it can work up to it. It can't, can't work under hard water conditions. It can work up to a TDS of about 150. The TDS is higher than that. Uh, it will work, but it, the efficiency will not be so high. Yeah. Normal cell also has. Uh, Correct. But it's not porous. It's not porous. The reason why rice as cash is so, is so attractive is because of the, if you look at the, the microstructure, it is highly porous. And it's porous on a scale which is what we call meso, it's mesoporous, which means the pores are a nanoscale dimension. So the surface area is much higher than sand, which means I can put a lot of silver inside and the filtration is much more effective. The conventional method also uses They, use, they just use sand. Sand and charcoal is what, you know, that's what they do, yeah. So it is, well, given if I take up like bloody or the sandy 
Which is exactly the question he's talking about, right? So suspended impurities we can pre-filter. Suspended impurities is not a problem. You can just take a cloth, mm. it'll take it out. But his question is more valid. If it's hard water and if you have uh, what we call TDS, total dissolved solids, it's not so effective. So if you take muddy water and the TDS is low in the muddy water, if you just filter out the suspended impurities, it'll work very well. We tried it against in Ganga water. So we, we, we're all very pious and we believe that the Ganges is very clean and all that, but the microbial load in Ganga water is very high. It's 10 to the 8. TDS will also be reduced to some extent because there's activated silica, you can actually remove some of the dissolved ions, uh, but it's not, that's not what we claim though. The main claim is killing of bacteria and viruses. In this. It doesn't need electricity. No, it does not require electricity, yes. So, what is this one? Uh, it used to be about 1000 rupees, the whole thing. The, the cartridge is about 300 rupees, but I think now they've increased the price a little bit, but still it's very economical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Now, now maybe it's about 1300 rupees. That's about it. Yeah. Yes, you can buy it online too. Yeah, you can buy it. I think I should charge Tata Chemicals for <laughs> consultancy and marketing, which I should do that, right? Plastic. It's plastic, but it's uh, again food grade plastic. It has to be. Everything is food grade in this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So, how we achieve that? Okay. So, I, I focus primarily on the technology piece, right? Now, it's a very good question. How did we actually promote this product? How did we market it? So we did a trial in um, Dindakal in Tamil Nadu. So we, we came up with this product and we deployed about 100. It was a pilot study that we did. So we just gave it to them and we asked them to use it over a period of time. We did not tell them what the purifier does. Right? So it's, obviously, when you do a pilot, you, you kind of do it like a black box. So you, they were asked to use it for a period of something like six months. And then we got the feedback. Now, you know what, if you, if you tell a customer it has nano silver inside, etc., they don't understand. So you just tell them what are the benefits of the water that comes out. So afterwards, we collected data from the households and what they saw. And for one thing, the, they liked the water, it did not affect the, the taste of the water. They said that the incidence of sickness in the children came down. So we got all these anecdotal uh, data that was verified and we were also looking at the performance. So as they were using it, we were measuring how much of silver comes out in this water because we have to be below 20 ppb as required by the US EPA. So we collected a lot of data of many of these water purifiers that were running continuously. So we did that pilot study. Once we were confident that the recipe that we used, the technology that we used for making the water purifier was successful, then of course there's a media launch and there's a huge marketing exercise that happened. In fact, Mr. Ratan Tata himself came to launch this product. So after the nano, it's probably the only one that he's done. He felt very passionate about this. So he launched the product and of course we use our existing distribution channels to sell this product to Tata Chemicals. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Can it be taken to a larger scale? Like this is the water supplied at home, so we are doing filtration. But before being supplied at home, there uh, then also we require filtration, like slow slow sign filtration and high sign filtration after sedimentation and coagulation. Yes. They are uh, used uh, grained uh, sand particles. Like we we grain the sand Correct. for filtration, and Correct. that is very expensive because graining of soil particles is not that Correct. easy. So if it, if it is cost effective, that can it replace that conventional system? This, that's a good question. In fact, we were uh, once this product was launched, right? We were asked the same question: Can you make community level uh, systems? Like in a village, instead of everyone owning one, why don't we just have one a huge one, and the villagers will collect the water and take it, right? But the reason why we didn't go down that route, in fact, this is scalable. You can scale it. You can actually make a community level system. But the reason we didn't do it is because if you set up a community level system, 
people collect the water and then they take it home. From the point of collecting the water to going home, there's a lot of contamination that can happen. You don't know, right? There could be microbial contamination. Somebody might put his hand inside, whatever. Uh, and then we get, you know, there are a lot of legal aspects. Whenever you launch a product, remember that there's a lot of liabilities on you which can happen. If we claim that it kills all the bacteria, viruses, we want to be absolutely sure that it, it happens, right? So we cannot, we, we didn't want, we can do it. And I'm sure that there's a framework that we can create to make a community system. But when we launched the product, we didn't want to go down that route simply because from the tap to your home, nobody knows what's going to happen. It can get contaminated and then we didn't, the first launch that we did, we didn't want to get into all those issues. But definitely it is scalable. It can be done. Um, we haven't done it. I mean, Tata Chemicals has stayed away from that particular path. So these are things that as technologists we don't think about, right? When you actually deploy something and somebody asks you this question, then you worry about the other aspects. It has to reach home, it has to be safe when it gets into your home, which is why we prefer it to be in your kitchen. You collect the water and you use it immediately. It doesn't go anywhere, right? So there's, the chances of contamination are minimized. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> the ID Bombay Monash Academy is a joint venture between Monash University Melbourne, you've heard about Monash and ID Bombay. We run a PhD program. It's only a PhD program across all branches of engineering, sciences, humanities and social sciences and industrial design. So, all the departments on campus here are part of the academy, all the departments at Monash are part of the academy. Students that get into the academy, it's a very tough selection process that we have. But once the student gets in, they spend three years in IIT Bombay and one year at Monash in Australia. And they get a dual degree, both from IIT Bombay and Monash. And they're doing very well. So we've had 88 students graduating. Um, we have 185 students in the academy today. It's quite big. And it's just across the road. So maybe if you have time, you can come across. Yeah? I leave my cards on the table, visiting cards, yeah? So please take them. Or maybe I can give it to you right now. Yeah. Thanks. I'll give you, I think I have enough for all of them. Okay. I cannot disappoint the ladies, yes, can yeah, I? I met a guy from business scholar from IIT Bombay. She was working in IIT Monash. Yes. She came and came to us to conference in Italy. What's her name? Uh, Shivali? Shivali Banerjee or was it uh, Jumur? Jumur. Jumur, yeah. Jumur yeah. She's doing extraordinary work on uh, yeah, fruit on paste. Mango, mango Correct. Like that. Extraction of pectins and stuff like that. Yeah. She's uh, graduated, by the way. She's finished. Yeah. Good. So you know the academy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was useful and we'll stay in touch. Right?